I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Dateable listeners 10% off your first order with code Dateable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So So what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATEABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. you also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Dateable Podcast, where we dive into modern dating and try to help you explain why people do the shit that they do and say the things that they do while we're all trying to navigate modern dating ourselves. That is true. And then one of the things that is always lingering with modern dating is the future, right? To get married, to have children, all the stuff that comes after dating. And, you know, we've heard a lot of people even say, like, there's a lot of pressure in dating because I know I want to have kids or I don't want to have kids or I'm not sure if I want to have kids and that how do I find someone that's on the same page? It's one of those things that feels like you're really putting the car to go ahead of the horse. But in reality, that it is a necessity to think about because it is so essential to lifestyle and future and ultimate compatibility, I think. You get to a certain age where, I don't know, for me, I all of a sudden woke up one day and was like, oh my God, this is a real thing. I really yeah. got to think about if I want kids or not. You know, in my early 20s, it was just like, yeah, in the future, I'll think about it. I'm sure I'll have them. It'll just be a given. But I think, I don't know, let me think. When I hit 35 was probably when it got yeah. real. Because that's kind of like the last year that you should freeze your eggs if you wanted to. And then really having that conversation with your partner. Do we want to have kids? If we do. We probably should start trying now. And now at 40, it's like, I'm almost at the stage of like, if it happens, it happens. And if it does, 
doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. It's interesting because I'm actually, I went in to talk about freezing my eggs. Like I went in for a consult and I'm 38. Mm-hmm. So it's, yes, it's obviously the better, the earlier you do it, the better in general. But they always, they're, I mean, they're obviously trying to push people to do it to some degree, but it's like yeah. then 40 is that sliding scale and all of the pieces. Mm-hmm. And I will say it is so overwhelming. And I think that's why I avoided it for so long because I think part of it was I was unsure and I still am not 100%. Like I'm kind of on your boat. Like feel like if I don't have kids, it's not, I don't feel like I'll live like a meaningless life. Like I feel very fulfilled mm-hmm. in life. Um, so I'm not feeling that way. But there are sides of, you know, I'm like, obviously, I'm an aunt now and I have a lot of friends with kids yeah. and you start to see, you know, just how nice it can be to be more of a family unit. And I think honestly, before my current partner, I really couldn't picture myself having kids with any of my past partners, whether like they just didn't want Mm -hmm. them themselves or they weren't in the place to have them. Like there was a lot of reasons why it just wasn't something that I was like top of mind for me. And I think because it wasn't like a huge urge within myself and then it wasn't, you know, coming to light with other partners, I kind of just was like, oh, this is a lot to deal with. I'm just not going to kind of avoided it in a way. And I will say this, like when I went in for the consult, I was like, I don't know anything about my body. And we talk about this with our guest Mm. today, Kate, who has a phenomenal podcast, Be There at Five. And I heard her do this episode all about being a childless millennial and really like pondering, you know, the things that I feel like a lot of people are afraid to say, kind of like of the Mm -hmm. indecision that happens. And I was like, UA, we need to get Kate on our podcast to talk about this. And I'm so glad we did. (laughs) This is such an honor honest and emotional conversation that we're about to have. Mm -hmm. Trigger warning, though, for people, we do talk about miscarriages. If there's anyone that you know this this is triggering to, you decide if this is something you want to listen to. We Mm. totally get it. If you need to skip it for whatever reason, want to call that out now. Um, But I think for anyone that you know is on the edge and unsure, or even if you are sure and you don't have that partner yet, I think that this is a great episode to listen to. Or, you know, even if you're sure that you don't want to have kids, it's, you know, there's a lot of validation and certain reluctances that we have. And for men too, I think it's a great episode for all everyone to listen to because you get to hear the decision process and also like the shit that we have to go through <laughs> to yes. even get pregnant. It's ridiculous. And that the shit that we have to go through after we get pregnant is equally as ridiculous. So I think it's just, I don't know, creates more empathy, but <laughs> you get to hear more transparently the emotional and the physical battles yeah. um, that we have when it comes to fertility. <laughs> but we'll save that conversation for this episode because that is a much heavier topic. On mm-hmm. a lighter note, I don't know, Julie, if you can tell half my face is not moving because <laughs> half my face is numb. And this is just like such a cute story of you and your college girlfriends get together, you know, yep. like once a year, right? Like for a big thing. And this is, we had our big thing, my, okay. me and my college girlfriends, and we hadn't done it in two years. So we're like, let's just go all out. We got this beautiful suite in Malibu, nice. this hotel, um, gorgeous hotel in Malibu. And then we booked reservations at Nobu Malibu, which is like Ooh. the see and be seen kind of place. So we're super excited. We get there. It's like supposed to be such a cute, fancy dinner. And in the middle of it all, my fucking crown falls off. And it's not the first time this has happened to me, but the first time has ever happened to me at a fine dining establishment. So Mm. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to interrupt the dinner. And I just pop it back in with my tongue, thinking that maybe it's just like a fluke. You know, (laughs) when you're not a dentist, you just make up shit in your mind. Like, you know what? Maybe just it just came off this once, but it's fine. It'll go back. It'll never come out again. Of course, after dinner, all the subsequent meals, my crown falls off time and time again. So I had an emergency dental appointment this morning to get my crown put back on (laughs) and half my face is numb. And this is what happened when you are 40 and you're trying to have a nice girls night out and your fucking crown comes out. I mean, bringing this back to kids, remember when the best thing was to have the tooth fairy come? Like it was an accomplishment <laughs> to lose a tooth. Thank when you. For it. <laughs> When you're 40 without kids, it's just bad karma. I don't know. It's just aging. <laughs> but did you ever have the tooth fairy come? Like, I remember I used to get like a dollar under my pillow. Do you want me to be your tooth fairy, UA, and leave you a dollar? Yeah. Yeah. Except can you leave me $5,000? Because that's how much it's going to be to get my implant. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, you know, if someone left a dollar for me, I'd be like, fuck you. You know how much my teeth are worth right now? It's like my teeth are worth a BMW at this point. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that like to tie it into our episode too, I feel like there are so many <laughs> things that are just so much easier as a child. I spent the weekend in Tahoe and it was so nice mm-hmm. and unfortunately did not snow. I'm not a big skier or snowboarder, so it wasn't a huge deal for me, but I think my boyfriend and my other friend were a little disappointed. Yeah. And we spent the weekend the weekend at my friend's house and she has a one-year-old who is very, very adorable. And I, I do enjoy spending more time with kids. There's like a lot of cuteness and like seeing for sure. just how easily entertained they are. Mm-hmm. He, like her son was, wasn't was even playing with toys. He was like taking a measuring cup oh, and yeah. just bringing this measuring cup around to everyone. And he kept giving it to me like he was like doing this grand gesture every how time. Cute. And then I would give it back to him. And I was like, it's so funny that you don't even have to invest in like crazy toys to keep them entertained. But then I will say my boyfriend really does want to have kids. And the child that we stayed with was started to scream uh-huh. around. Um, uh-huh. I don't know. I would say 8 a.m. And I turned to him and I was like, this is the side of having kids, yep. you know? <laughs> yep. They're fucking adorable and fucking annoying. There was this one. I don't know what it was. It was like this book you could press on it. And there were different songs that played. Uh-huh. He kept playing it? Yeah, it was like Old McDonald, 20 different variations. We got on the car to leave and oh, my other friend my was gosh. like, I don't know if I could have taken another day of that music. It just plays nonstop. And we're like, do you think their parents have just tuned it out by now? And we're like, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or you do, you're you just so sleep deprived. None of this even matters anymore. Things change. Your tolerance changes after you have kids. And you're so right. You have to spend the night with the kid to yes. get the yes. full effect. Yes. Just a few hours. Of course, you're like, this kid is adorable. Oh my God, what a well-behaved kid. Until they become an asshole. Oh, I've definitely been at friends' houses when they start the temper tantrum. And I go home to my house all by myself myself and I am thrilled. (laughs) There is a lot of cuteness that comes with them. And I think just seeing the world through a child's eye, just like the innocence that comes with it will say that you can learn so much. You know, I think we've said this before. There's like articles that are like people with children probably experience the higher highs and the lower lows where people Mm -hmm. without children, it's more consistent. And I could totally see that. I think my life right now feels very like stress-free for the most part. The responsibility of another human is clearly going to be very rewarding, but there's stress that comes with that, of course. (sighs) Of course. And (laughs) <laughs> One of the many topics that we discuss on this episode. Let's get to our question because it is related. And we've gotten this question yeah. from both men and women who've said, I know I want to have kids. So how soon should I bring it up when it comes to dating? How early on in a relationship or in dating do you all have the kids conversation? I've seen people put it on their dating profiles, mm-hmm. want to get married, want to have kids. And I've I've seen people say open to kids or no kids, how soon should you bring it up if you know absolutely you want to have kids? I don't see any reason why it's a problem to put in your dating profile. I think a Mm. lot of dating apps too, it's not like you're putting it in your bio. You know, there was someone I remember we did a clubhouse event Mm -hmm. and Oh, it wasn't Clubhouse. It was this other version of them. Fishbowl? Yes, they were trying to be snarky. And it was like, my eggs aren't getting any younger. And we were like, no, don't put that. Like something (laughs) that was just like over the top. Yeah. I forget. It was even snarkier than that. I think I just like downplayed it completely. I can't even recall. But I remember listening and I was horrified. I was like, don't ever put that in your profile. (laughs) But I think it's okay to like mark the box. Like I want to have kids or even subtly putting it in your profile like, one day I want to have, you know, a family or something like that. If you really know you want to, I don't see any harm in doing it. For me, because I was unsure, I opted to uncheck the box. I was actually talking with my boyfriend about this and Mm. he was like, I can't remember if you had it or didn't have it. I'm like, I know I did not have it because I consciously did not check it and I did not want to say unsure. I just didn't want to put anything. Mm. But I remember he, he had it in his that he 
he wanted kids. It wasn't a like deference for me. I just didn't want to necessarily rule out people that didn't either because Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. So I think it really comes down to yourself and how much you want it. And you know, I'm I'm going off of Hinge just because that was the app that I used the most, but I'm pretty sure Bumble, OkCupid, Match. I, I don't know about Tinder, that one might not, but I think all the ones that are more like relationship oriented have fields that you could basically check. So you don't have to be super blatant about it, but you can still get the need across, right? That mm-hmm. you do desire this. Yeah. I think in early dating, I've had people ask, what are your absolute deal breakers on a first date? Yep. And then they go down the list and they would ask the questions like marriage, kids, are these deal breakers? And I thought that was a good way to gauge if someone's so definitive about something. Because when you absolutely want kids, all you're trying to do is filter out for the people who absolutely do not want to have kids. You can still talk to mm-hmm. the people who are unsure, but it's the people who are like, I yeah. absolutely do not. You know, I talked to this guy. He was like, I'm divorced. I don't want kids. We got divorced because I didn't want to have kids. So I just want to make sure that you know that. <laughs> and so you want to filter out for those people. So I think on these first dates, it's always good to get people's like definitive opinions and decisions that they've already made that are separate from you. Yeah, I do think that. But I think that being said, we've talked about this in sounding board events and stuff. And I think if someone doesn't put it on their profile or doesn't say it on date one, it doesn't mean that it's a hard no either. We've seen people swing kind of too far that they'll only go for people that say this. And of course, that's going to better the odds if that really is something that you want. But you also could be missing out on someone that could go either way or, you know, the right situation. Like I said, it took me a little while even to come to terms with the idea with my current partner. At the beginning, I was still more maybe leading the other way or a little unsure. Like I wasn't considering even doing egg freezing back then. But time has made that more something I can see in my life at some point. So I think sometimes we want to jump the gun on stuff, but we have to remember, do I even like this person in the first place. Yeah. I mean, some people date to find a a partner to have kids with. So I shouldn't say no one does. But if you're really looking for like a life partner and someone that you're truly in love with, I think the first step is saying, do I even like this person before maybe running down the laundry list of things you want and don't want? I would say by date two or three, though, maybe three, if like things are on a good path, then you do want to have that convo just so it doesn't like if if there's a hard no in the way, you can at least know and then decide what to do. I wouldn't want to say like, get to six months in and never have this conversation. But I think the first date, it's totally okay just to go in and be like, do I even like this person? Do I even have a good time with them? Because it almost doesn't matter if they want to have kids if you don't even like them, right? If you lead with kids, if that's something that's so important to you, you do, it's a self-selection process. You do get a specific type of person who's also just looking for kids and not necessarily a partner. This again, I'm throwing this back to the person who originally asked this question is prioritizing. Are you looking for a partner first? or Are you looking for kids right. first? Because you can also have kids without a partner, right? So that maybe that doesn't even play into dating. Maybe you just have this mindset, I'm going to have kids regardless whether I have a partner or not. Yep. So yeah, prioritize all of that. But I believe and you'll hear in this episode that keeping an open mind and everything's up for discussion is always the best way to approach uh-huh. anything. I think my partner and I started dating and we were both like, eh, eh. I don't know. And now we're like leaning more towards like we're more 60, 70 percent. Yes. And then maybe we'll shift mm-hmm. out of that. But it's <laughs> it's a it's a constant indecision that we just have to accept and you'll never be completely be ready for kids. They all say that. Yes. You and I both walked away from this episode being like, this was such a powerful episode. It made, I think because it is something that is very top of mind for both of us, and it probably is for many of you out there as well. Whether you're dating someone seriously or not, I think it could be top of mind. And it was really assuring to just be like, it's okay if you don't know right now, or things can change. I think sometimes we feel like if we've committed to being the no kids type, it's like going back on it. One of my best friends, you know, she never really wanted 
wanted kids and her husband really did. And I mean, she wasn't a hard no, obviously, because she wouldn't have had them, but it wasn't a top thing. Like being, you know, a CEO and being like successful at her career was always more Mm -hmm. of a driver for her. And she has just embraced parenthood so much. So I think it's just sometimes lifestyles change. I even think about it, you know, like there was a period of my life that I didn't even desire a relationship at all. Mm -hmm. And then one day, like something switched. And I think that's okay. That's just natural progression. We're all evolving. So UA, before we get into announcements, I do want to get your thoughts on one thing, though, as we're going on this. So we were just talking about it, right? Just brought something up for me. You and I know plenty of people that have gotten to a certain age and they say, you know, I just need a husband to have kids with and have a family Mm. or Mm -hmm. vice versa. What are your thoughts? Like, do you think that that can work? Let's say you really are the type of person and we may have listeners out there like this. I don't want to, you know, generalize everyone. Maybe we have a listener out there that's like, I want to date as a means to an end to find a partner. From your opinion, do you think that can work? I think it can absolutely work if you can set the right expectations. My mom personally has a few friends like this who've been married before, who did the whole love thing. Those did not work out. And now they're approaching their 60s and 70s. And they've told me, I just want a partner and companion. I don't need to be in love. I just need to know that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. And their relationships have Mm -hmm. worked. They're almost platonic, but they keep each other safe. They are emotionally supportive of each other. And they fulfill these needs for each other. But the expectations are even set. They've said to me, not looking for love, looking for purely companionship. That kind of reminds me of Bernice, actually, a Mm. few episodes back, how she was saying on the episode that we did, the pressure to settle down, she was talking about how her parents, um, you know, had this pressure for her and almost themselves too. And once they relinquished that and they were like, okay, we're actually getting older and we're really not going to find another partner, Mm -hmm. we might as well enjoy each other's company that's when they started to really do a lot of stuff and she saw them like fall in love again and be happy Mm -hmm. so i almost feel like it's sometimes your expectations just could be wildly off too that yes. this person is going to be your everything. And I don't know. I mean, I think like I want to believe I'm definitely a romantic as yes. I've learned from Logan's quiz and some of the things <laughs> out there. And I I want to believe that like your person can be your everything, but maybe like the people that hold out longer to find someone are on that boat and then other people kind of are more realistic. I don't know. And maybe it just changes you need to know what's best for you. And if you're chasing a Hollywood dream of a rom-com, yeah. we all know that's not the real deal. So what are you looking for when it comes to having a relationship and having a partnership? For some people, it is a very practical reason. For others, it's completely romantic. And that's okay. All of it is right. You just ha- you just got to do you, ultimately. Yep, and find someone that's also on the same page. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the hard hardest part. (laughs) That's why we're here. Right. Yeah, it's always finding someone who is on the same page and willing to try and make an effort to make it work. What brought this up? A discussion happened? Or did you watch a movie? That- <laughs> no, it was just from the question of the day. What I was saying on the first day, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't even like the person versus kind of interviewing them for this one role. But I think if you're, I don't know, I, I, don't, I never want to say like the one role, because I think even the people that we know that have definitely, maybe it's been a little more apparent that they've picked a partner f- to have kids. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there was other things too. It wasn't just <laughs> you're filling a role. That sounds so horrible when you put it that way. Yeah. But I think it was just from the question of what to prioritize and when to ask it. I think so much of it comes down to what is the priority for you. And yeah, I mean, some people might have more of like a pragmatic view on relationships and others might be more in the romantic side. So maybe that really just depends on the individual as well. And that's why we see so many non-traditional relationships that have popped up. You know, you have the polyamorous open relationships, yep. but also look at the will and grace relationship too. We've, we've <laughs> heard of those. You're in a platonic friendship with someone, you s- support them and prioritize them, and then you seek sexual pleasure elsewhere. That to me almost makes so much more sense. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, we need to get someone like that on the podcast. Yes. That's a good guess. Anybody out That's there who's guess. in a will and grace situation? For anyone new to dateable, we always say you do you. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the 
luxury that we have in today's day and age that we don't have to be in relationships for financial reasons or to bear children. Like it's hard to sometimes step back and look at modern dating in a way that is advantageous. I think so many of us, you know, have stereotypes that are more on the negative side, but there are a lot of benefits. And I think with Dateable, we've really seen that you create the relationship you want. Ultimately, it's about being happy and finding what works for you, whether that's with a partner, with many partners, with no partner, you do you. Agreed. (laughs) Okay, announcements this week. I think this is a good episode to share with a friend. If you have a friend that's debating whether to have children or not, it's a big ass decision. I think this is the episode to share. This is such a great look into all the things that are going on for women out there. And especially, you know, even share it with your male friends. Mm -hmm. It's really important to know the other side of the equation because ultimately this is a decision for everyone. Uh, So definitely share it with a friend. And, you know, if you love us, leave us a five star review. We Mm -hmm. really like it really makes or breaks this podcast and it keeps us going and it keeps us delivering great guests like we have today for you. So that would be our maybe our holiday gift. Hanukkah just ended, but Christmas is around the corner. Our holiday gift is to leave us a five star review. Thank you. Please do. And if you want to just check out what we're up to, you can always find us on social media at Dateable Podcast. Awesome. Let's do a few quick messages from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by First Leaf. I love to explore new wines, but I'm not always sure what to get. And I really don't want to be disappointed. That's why I love First Leaf Wine Club. They remove all the guesswork, doing all the hard work to discover great wines so I can just enjoy them. First Leaf believes wine is personal. They create a custom wine print for each member and maps their vast portfolio of wines to each person's unique taste preferences once you take their five-minute quiz. And then the more wines you rate, the more each shipment is personalized to your taste. That is why my recent shipment of Pinotage from South Africa is so on point, but I would have never picked it out myself. Celebrate your special first and the moments that count with First Leaf, the wine club designed to help you discover new wines you'll love, personalized to your taste and delivered to your door. Join today and you'll get six bottles of wine for $29.95 with free shipping. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash dateable. That's tryfirstleaf.com slash dateable for six bottles of wine for $29.95 with free shipping. Here's a toast to firsts. May you enjoy them with the people you love from the first sip to the last. Try firstleaf.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. This episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. This holiday season, I want to give a gift to my loved ones that makes them feel special and unique, just like the relationship we share. That's why I'm giving them StoryWorth, which is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. Every week, StoryWorth emails your loved one a thought-provoking question of your choice from their vast pool of possible options. The prompts are super unique, like... If you could see into the future, what would you want to find out? Hmm, I wonder how my parents would answer that one. And after one year, StoryWorth will compile all the stories and photos into a beautiful keepsake book. I'm looking forward to looking through the books every year as a holiday tradition. With StoryWorth, I'm giving those I love most a thoughtful, personal gift from the heart and preserving their memories and stories for years to come. Go to storyworth.com slash dateable and save $10 on your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash dateable. D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to save $10 on your first purchase. Okay, let's hear it from Kate all about the decision to have kids or not. The big question is wanting kids, yes or no? How do we get to that decision? How should we even think about that question? And we're so honored to have Kate Kennedy with us for this episode, who is someone who has talked about this topic before. So we'll get into that. But Mm -hmm. she's 34 years old. She lives in Chicago, originally from Richmond, Virginia. She is married, a pop culture commentator, author, and podcast host of the show called Be There in Five. Hi, Kate. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks for being here. And yeah, that kind of segues to it. But I heard your deep dive on your podcast, Be There in Five. It's called Childless 
this millennial. And I feel like it just gave so many opinions about just motherhood and, you know, all the things that are kind of going through a lot of our minds that we don't always know how to verbalize because I think more than ever women are deciding if motherhood is for them, where in the past it was kind of expected. So we're really excited to kind of have this conversation with you where we go into it all. And then we also heard your most recent episode around the miscarriage. A lot of friends of mine I know have gone through that and it's something that's just never talked about. So I think it's like really important to like share that out there. And I'm glad that you were able to do that on your podcast and just in a way like normalize that this is a part of, you know, the whole process of pregnancy. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, when I first ventured out and doing childless millennial, it was kind of like, uh, it was kind of unplanned, but it was like a lot of bottled up feelings about people asking me constantly if and when I wanted kids. And then I had so many confusing thoughts about it. I kind of put it all out there with that in a very inconclusive way of all my <laughs> intersecting thoughts mm-hmm. because to almost you know encourage people like a lot of some things don't have resolve and some things are really complicated decisions and highly personal and beyond that I wanted to create a space where women at any stage of the process can have a voice I think I, I you feel very shut down when you're speaking to women that are certain mm-hmm. uh, one way or the other yeah and uh, I think it's valid to be able to communicate your complicated feelings at any stage I mean it's important that people have a voice and are able to share in every phase of it, I think. Yeah. And that's so important to hear, too, because sometimes we feel like that decision is being made for us, especially for some of us culturally. Sometimes it's based on societal expectations. So it's important for us to have this conversation. And I think men and women alike will find this to be insightful and eye-opening, even if someone's unable to have bear children themselves. So can you take us back to October 2020, in the middle of COVID, when you released this two-part series, what was going on in your life at that time? It actually started as it usually does in the most superficial of places (laughs) where I'm scrolling through content and it kind of triggers something and I kind of choose to look at the deeper meaning. I Mm. often refer to my podcast as meaningful discussions about meaningless topics. By that, I mean, (laughs) I was literally going through TikToks that I found really sexist that were popular at the time where men would play pranks on their wives and be like, okay, I called a babysitter. We're going to go to Starbucks and then we're going to go to Target and then we're going to go get a peach smoothie. And then, and the mom, the, the, like the women, the moms would get like orgasmically excited over very mm. basic trips brands. I actually think I know the TikTok you're referring to. Yeah, I was going to say, you two probably have a lot in in common. <laughs> I've totally <laughs> seen that one and I and remember I was the same going through feeling. The comments and everyone was like, oh my gosh, yes, queen, get out of the house, have the best day. And I'm like, on what planet are we worshiping <laughs> men for covering off our basic needs to Thank go you. to like <laughs> suburban fast casual restaurants like I shouldn't you be able to go regardless uh, and I just there was so it became a trend and the women seemed like trapped and needlessly excited and I just mm-hmm. was like and then I I said on uh, Instagram like I don't know if I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this but as a person who's not sure how they feel about kids social media makes motherhood look incredibly daunting yes like, yes you have no time to yourself you'll never have sex again you're so tired you're this and that and that all might be true But there's a level of absorption that's hard on my end uh, because I don't get to experience the joy that offsets that of a person who really wants it and is experiencing the upsides. So if you're anxious about it, hearing about all the downsides, it kind of makes you spiral in a way that I wasn't sure was allowing me to make a fair decision based on what it would actually be like for me, but it was kind of being projected onto it. And the reason I was nervous and you can't really say that is because it is hard and I want people to be able to share and find community. They shouldn't have to alter their content for me, but I just wanted to be allowed to say, I find this to be incredibly difficult terrifying. So have you always been kind of on the fence if you want children or like what has been kind of your relationship with the idea? I actually would say more so than anything, I've always wanted them. Okay. But Mm -hmm. I I kind of either expected to wake up with this all knowing feeling of like, now's the time. Yeah. Or I would say, you know, like eventually I'll get there. And I think what happened last year is that I realized I'm at an age where I need to maybe like start to figure this out. Mm-hmm. And I I just became very overwhelmed that my crutch for indecision was time. But now time is my enemy as it relates to having the choice. Mm. And I kind of feel like there's a weird inverse relationship for people that aren't totally sure and that they need more time. But yeah, more time can affect fertility. And it just, I don't know. I, I think that I've always wanted them. It's just when I got to an age where it would be appropriate, I was kind of surprised that I'd never had this like epiphany that you hear people Mm -hmm. talk about. 
Mm, that's fascinating because you've always wanted kids and you were looking for that final sign to say, yes, now you're ready. I feel like I've been the opposite as I've always been unsure about yeah. kids and never really wanting them. And I'm, I've am i been looking for that, like, wake up one yes. morning yeah. and being like, yes, I fucking want kids. <laughs> and all my friends have told me that that day will never come. So maybe we can go through some of the thought processes that we've had around having kids. What made you decide that you did want to have kids eventually? Kate? Um, the biggest thing for me was uh, having nephews and a niece related to me. I do not, I'm not a super maternal or kid friendly person by <laughs> nature. Or, and, but when kids are related to you, for me, my experience was a bit mm. different. And I really mm. enjoyed kind of re experiencing the world through their lens. And I love them so much. And it's, I've, I mean, but it's always kind of been a joke in my family that I'm not maternal. Like I went to my sister's kindergarten class and I, she told me to ask the kids to pack up and I told them to consolidate their belongings. Either five. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, just, I just don't even know how to talk to children. So it's, it's a confusing thing where I actually even have trouble disseminating, like, have I always wanted them or do I always think I would have them, which are technically right, different things, right? right? Totally different things. Yep. So I, it's a, anyways, I would say the biggest turning point in, or nudge of me being like, yeah, I could really do this was having kids related to me. But then the older I got, the less interested I was because it completely intersects, like the peak of your career intersects with when you need to mm-hmm. kind of start thinking about it, at least in my case. And I was, I'm like, wait, so I have to get, I have to drop everything. I have spent mm-hmm. my entire life trying to get these ducks in a row. And then now I'm just supposed to, like I said in the episode, do a cannonball into these ducks and act like none of them matter. Because women tell me, well, nothing else matters. You'll love it. You'll never look back. And I'm like, but I want this stuff to matter. I worked my ass off for this stuff right. to matter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that is my biggest fear for sure. And I think some of it is that I like my life currently. And I'm afraid yeah. that it will drastically change and maybe not for the better. Because I think the highs are high with children, but the lows can also be really low. And I think some of it's what you said, Kate, about just the way mom life is like portrayed on social media that you don't see the benefits, but you just see what it does to your lifestyle. And I definitely have fears on that. And I think it's been interesting because my current partner really wants children and we've been talking about it more. And I definitely see the benefits and like want to like have the family that comes with children. And like the, I think the other fear is, are you going to regret it in a couple of years? Like if you don't make that time, because Mm -hmm. as women, we feel like we have this, you know, time time window almost. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. there's a fear for me on the other side too. And I'm I'm definitely like flip-flop a lot in my mind. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. And I feel like I always assumed like what you said, Kate, that I would have kids. Mm-hmm. I just never pause to think, do I want kids? Just like when I'm in middle school and thinking I will eventually get married and have kids. That wasn't a decision I made back then. It's just you assume your life just goes in that path. And now Mm -hmm. it's a real moment for us that we have to make these decisions and make these what I call sacrifices. To be quite blunt, all the friends I have in my life, it is absolutely more burden on the woman. Mm -hmm. Even if the man steps in and does a lot of the work, the woman still does predominantly most of it. And no matter how much we try to create an equal partnership, when it comes to raising kids, it's not equal. And that's something that I have a hard time facing is Mm -hmm. that is a lot to take on. It really, yeah, it absolutely is. One of the most like groundbreaking things I learned when I was researching more about the decision to have kids is is there's a term for like the uh, physical changes your body goes through when you have a kid that's comparable to adolescence that's called matrescence. And it's like... Mm -hmm the actual chemical and physical overhaul going on in your body that is a comparable level of change to adolescence. But when you're going through puberty, people are like, LOL, this is awkward. It's fine. But motherhood, you feel like you need to kind of angelically float through and be grateful for these immense changes your body and mental health and your time and schedule are going through. And I think that that's an added thing is so much of the mental load and invisible labor one, but also like this incredible change going on that society doesn't even acknowledge for the difficulty it is. Like you feel Mm. like pressure to love every minute of it. And that's that would be confusing for me. And then you if you do complain about it, you feel ungrateful because a lot of people have fertility issues, right? right? It's right. endlessly complicated. Yeah. It is. I think the point you bring up too about this weird like paradox almost that like by the time you're more ready to have kids, whether that's like you're more financially stable or your career is in a place that's taking off, then it also makes it more complicated because your fertility is declining, especially for women. But even for men, I feel like we never talk talk about that, that for men too, the older we get, it 
becomes more difficult. Like what are kind of like some of your thoughts or like how have you come to terms with some of that? I don't know that I have. I I, mm. I think that it's, it's almost confusing to me how I obsessively will be like, do I have enough money? Do I have enough time? Do I have family nearby? Like I think about all these things I would need to feel comfortable to move forward. And then you see people in a variety of circumstances just mm-hmm. Right. Just doing it. Move forward yeah. willing. Like they don't need to have anything in place. It's just they figure it out as they go. And I I think like the I guess biggest thing for me is like I don't have any answers. I f- still feel all the same anxieties. I have all the same concerns. It I, I kind of just felt like it snuck up on me that I was working and building up toward this career. And then realistically, when I realized that I would it would completely have to halt and uh, I'd have to completely move things around to make parenting work work in this finite period of time when I feel like there's, I don't know, I I could go on and on, but I I just, I still feel that way. And I've never quite been able to solve it other than I just am hoping that like everything else, I'd figure it out as I went. And I also am trying to be realistic about like, you can want to be a parent, but doesn't mean you have to like being pregnant. Doesn't mean you have to enjoy the process of, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like those are kind of different things too. So I think that, yeah, the pregnancy piece, I'm a little hung up on too, just in terms of like my friends are all so sick. How do you, how the hell am I supposed to work? And also sick? just a, it's an identity change. It's a physical, yeah. mental identity change. I've had so many friends tell me, I used to be a runner. Mm-hmm. I used to be this successful businesswoman. And now my identity is just mom. You know, that's, that's it. And all the other facets of my life have disappeared now that I'm putting all my attention on, on this child. So what do you think is, I know there are no answers, but what is the right way to think about this? Do we just say, just go with it, just see what happens, <laughs> go with the flow and then deal with it as it comes. I think that uh, a couple of things. One, I, to your point about the identity piece, I think that's a really fascinating element of social media too, is in everyone's bio, it's like wife, mom, like mm-hmm. there, there's there's this interesting thing for women where our identity, the older we get, is kind of almost a function of who we are to other people, yeah. and who mm. we, not who we are as ourselves. And like, yeah, I'm a wife, but that's not the first way I identify. <laughs> Huh. Should it be? And yeah, I think that that's definitely a shift I see with motherhood. And I mean, I might experience that shift. Like, I don't know. You will you might see Faith Family Football in my bio tomorrow. I, <laughs> we always change our minds. Um, but uh, no, to answer your question, I think, well, I guess I can only speak from my me now, who has mm-hmm. since experienced a uh, miscarriage or rather an ectopic mm-hmm. pregnancy, which was kind of a unique medical outlier of a situation that was quite uh, emotionally and physically painful. The decision is one piece, but then your decision is to start trying, not that you'll mm-hmm. be able to have them. Right, mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. We forget that a lot. A whole other, I don't know if I can curse, that's a whole yep. other mind fuck oh, yeah. in a sense of like, uh, I I was a little on the fence about the right timing, knowing that I wanted children. Specifically, I wanted to have my husband's children. And this is something we both want together. And what didn't happen for, I don't know, eight or nine months. And then it did happen. And then it was a unexpected loss. It was an interesting thing where I guess I share that because at every stage, I think there is going to be a lot of discomfort and pain. There's just no, there are no guaranteed outcomes. Mm -hmm. And the reason I keep saying I don't have a solution or what do we do is because like, I think that there's really nothing you can do besides make the best decision for you and your family in the time you're in and like hope for the best and be honest with yourself along the way. And that's kind of what I chose to do. I told everyone I wasn't sure. Then I told everybody when I changed my mind and was devastated. I don't think we have to be these fixed. No. you know, products that all like we label ourselves as a as a mom or a person who always wants kids or a person that will do anything and everything to try to have them. Like I wanted to be an example of a person allowed to change their mind, allowed mm-hmm. to weather through like ups and downs and to mm-hmm. just like evolve as a person. And I've warmed up to the idea a lot more since trying because I think mm. it helped me fill some gaps in my level of desire uh, when I realized it wasn't something that was necessarily my choice, even if I had made that decision. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess I can only speak from experience, but I think that the biggest turning point too was when after doing that episode and letting it all out, I felt worlds better about mm. moving forward. Cause I just, I didn't know until that point, until that was well received that I could be a person, especially in this space that was allowed to not be so rosy all the time yes. about motherhood. And I was like, if I can do this my way, 
with my own kids and it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. My fear was doing it their way and how they are portraying motherhood yeah. with their mm-hmm. kids. And I think just finding some empowerment and uh, us all being different and having different desires and that being perfectly okay. I think the pressure we put on our, ourselves is largely a function of like stereotypes put on women, expectations put on women and these like benevolent sexism toward us that we're supposed to have all fulfillment through it. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's pause right there for a few messages. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. We at Datable are huge fans of therapy, and BetterHelp can match you with your own licensed therapist and connect you in a safe and private online environment. Me, for example, I was able to start communicating with my therapist in less than 48 hours. It was so quick. Now, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Their licensed professionals specialize in everything from dating trauma, stress, anxiety, trauma with a big T, uh, depression, grief, you name it. They have someone who's an expert in that. We at Dateable wish for all of you to live a happy, healthy life. And that's why as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash dateable. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, Again, that's BetterHelp, spelled H-E-L-P, dot com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. This episode is made possible by ZocDoc. Finding and booking a doctor who's right for you doesn't need to be a terrible experience. Will they take your insurance, understand your needs, or be available when you can see them? With ZocDoc, the answer can be a refreshingly pain-free yes. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. You simply just go to ZocDoc.com, choose a time slot, and whether you want to see the doctor in person or do a video visit. And just like that, you're booked. And that's exactly how I found my new doctor after moving to LA. Every month, millions of people use ZocDoc, and I'm one of them. It's my go-to whenever I need to find and book a doctor. Finding a quality doctor really shouldn't be that complicated. ZocDoc makes a search so much more pleasant. For our listeners, go to ZocDoc.com slash dateable and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z O. O-C-D-O-C dot com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. ZocDoc dot com slash Datable. This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to ViaHemp.com and use the code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's ViaHemp.com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. Living with ADHD can be a challenge and dating with ADHD is definitely a challenge, we've heard many of you say. But finding the right care and proper tools needed to succeed can be life-changing. Dunn is an online ADHD care platform that can get you all the resources you need to help manage your ADHD. Online visits, refills, and a 24-7 care team made for you. In just one minute, Dunn's online assessment can help kickstart your ADHD treatment journey. With experienced clinicians, worry-fill refills, and online visits, you can start getting personalized care as soon as today or tomorrow. So contact an expert team that can help you around the clock and get a personalized treatment plan just for you. Here's how you do it. Take a free one-minute assessment and book an appointment with a licensed ADHD clinician as soon as the next day. 
Get continuous care, one-click refills, insurance coverage, and 24-7 care team support with Done for just $79 a month. And pharmacy co-pays as low as $0. Visit get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. That's get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. Done. Turn ADHD into your strength. This episode is made possible by Armoire. Armoire makes getting dressed easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, build the perfect wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. All you have to do is take a five-minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out. Listen, I live in Southern California. There is absolutely no need for puffer coats or any sort of those winter jackets. But when I travel anywhere else in the world in these cold months, I'm often burdened with the task of getting winter clothes. And now with Armoire, I can just rent my winter wardrobe. It's brilliant. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.com style slash datable. That is armoire.style spelled A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try armoire today. There was actually a post in our Facebook group around, you know, this feeling of I actually like, you know, waking up on a Saturday and not having responsibility, kind of going through a lot of the stuff that we were talking about earlier about what you see portrayed on social media. And then there was another comment that was from a mom and she said, by all due respect, like I think the post is a little stereotypical and I've made the life I want with a family. We travel all the time. We move to a place, you know, in Europe that we don't even have to play like college tuition and all that stuff. So it's it's more about like we can build the life that we want to build. Like how do you think people can start like breaking out of this mold of what social media and culture describes as the mom life and kind of go to what you were just saying of it's your decision to do it how you want to do it. I think that's that's a really good question. I I think that uh, the first step, you know, if you have a partner is to be so incredibly honest and upfront with how you feel and to not feel ashamed for Mm -hmm. a lack of certainty or a discomfort with the idea or not being ready. I think that the, the best chance you have at more equally devised labor is from the get go, I think to be like, we're in this together. Mm -hmm. This is going to be very high burden on me and my body specifically. And it's not that I resent that, but I want to be realistic about how I view our roles as parents. And I just see a lot of situations that bum me out where I feel like people say, oh, dad's babysitting tonight. I'm like, babysitting? (laughs) Yeah, that's his job. That's his own fucking kid. (laughs) Right. It's not his job. That's his life. Yes. (laughs) the, The women that wrote into for the second episode of Childless Millennial, by and large, with they said was the the reason their experience as a parent feels different than what they see in social media with their, a lot of their friends is because from the very beginning, their partner knew that they weren't messing around with equally dividing up what is dividable, divisible mm. rather. And I think that honesty is really important. Um, I just think in a lot of pockets of the world, there's a lot of shame around not taking to motherhood swimmingly or taking mm-hmm. some divine fulfillment from it. Doesn't mean you'll be a bad mom. And beyond that, I think like it's like anything with social media, we can't control the content people are sharing and everyone's entitled to reach their own audiences their own thing, but you kind of have to tune it out. Like Mm -hmm. it's kind of up to us to consume less of the stuff that's triggering. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't help that women are aggressively targeted by apps like Facebook and Instagram because they use age and gender demographics. But I like even took out their uh, settings in Instagram and Facebook, like show me less content related to parenting like that. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'll do, I'll do things like that. Or um, I don't know. I think that for me, it was like, I just need to stop consuming this because it's getting in my head. And it's not going to be my reality. I have choices. I have autonomy in this situation and I can do it the way I want. So I'd say like honesty and being more selective about what you consume and what influences you because we can't do a lot about it being shared. And there's value to people sharing that stuff because they need community too. That's a great tip. I just I'm so sick of this idea of being the ultimate powerful, you know, superwoman. You can do it all. And being a mom is always a component of that. It'd be like so and so is the CEO of this company and she's a mom, you know, and it, it feels like you're incomplete if you don't 
<laughs> yeah. Can you believe she can balance all that and an asshole husband? So it's she incredible cries to every me night. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's got two babies. One of them is her husband. So isn't it incredible that, you know, like it's it boggles my mind that the, the mom piece has to be part of that. Basically saying the more responsibilities women take on, the more perfect they are, which is just a crock of shit. But I want to go back to when we were talking about you can make the decision to have kids. And then there's the act of trying to have kids. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women experience fertility issues along the way. So can you take us back to June of this year when you did experience your miscarriage or um, you had another uh, term for it and take us through what was happening then? Yeah. So I guess after Childless Millennial through June, we had been trying and it wasn't happening. And it's just, that's kind of a thing that I think is just like alarming because especially growing up, like my public school just wanted me to think I was going to get pregnant so easily. I didn't even like understand how hard it is. There's like two days a month you can get pregnant. Like I I knew nothing. Um, I, you know, you're just trying not to for so long and then you try and you think it's going to just be easy and then it's not. And then it becomes almost this weirdly unromantic process where you're counting <laughs> days and yes. being on sticks. And I think that's a whole other layer of somebody who's a little more reluctant when you have to put in so much effort into trying, you almost wish you had the magic of it being accidental or you know, Mm -hmm, one mm -hmm. and done. And so I think that it's been actually good and helpful for me to learn more about my body and to go through that process of having fertility issues, just even understand what goes on. Mm -hmm. It made me less, I think it made me less scared of it, maybe as a result of exposure therapy. I don't know. But uh, yeah, in June, I was six weeks pregnant. And I mean, without going into too much detail, I was not feeling well and experienced a lot of complications. And I went to an ER and it turned out to be an ectopic pregnancy, which is tubal. So it means that it's a viable pregnancy in an unviable location, like an embryo can't survive in a fallopian tube. So you have to resolve it. And that is kind of a thing that depends on the person. But the issue is that at like the point of six weeks where I was, it could rupture because it won't survive there. And then you internally bleed and it can be very dangerous. It's, I think, the most fatal thing that can happen in your first trimester if not caught. So you have to resolve it through um, surgery or this like basically chemotherapy drug. And I don't know how much like detail you want me to go into, but uh, it, it was, I say this because I I think it's important women know this is possible because yeah. you could think you were having a heavy period at six weeks if you didn't know this was something that could happen. And yeah, so I was very surprised. I was in the ER. They on the spot are like, we need to remove your fallopian tube. And I was like, well, sorry, what? Like, I don't understand. What? Like, you're kind of grieving emotionally. And then there's this physical component of like, you have to take care of your own self and your own life first, because this is really threatening for the mother. And I was really freaked out and went through this. Um, uh, I don't know. It was it was kind of a confusing situation. And ultimately tried the less invasive method, which is are these injections that like take they're brutal. And um, I was in a weird situation where it, after that, it takes about four to six weeks for you to for the pregnancy to resolve, they say so to not have any pregnancy hormones. So I knew I wasn't going to be pregnant after six, but I ended up having pregnancy hormones for about 12. Wow. Even though six of those I knew I was waiting for like the tissue to resolve and pass. So it's a very confusing thing where the baby cannot survive and you have to choose how to miscarry it. Damn. Which is oh, a level of, of dark. I have trouble even talking about because wow. you feel like a walking tomb. <sighs> yeah. So that's that's what happened. It's a little different than a typical mm-hmm. six week miscarriage. And I did not know anything about that. Uh, so yeah, I in the day after I got on the mic uh, and talked <laughs> about it because I was like, oh my God, I'm miserable. Uh, and, and I'm in physical pain. And I'm bleeding and all these things. And most companies don't have like bereavement for miscarriages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was like, I could never. It's just hidden. It's like hidden a under a rug. No one ever job. talks about it. Right. And I think my friends and family thought I was crazy for doing that raw of an episode. But I was like, look, I like every woman has to show up to work after this is me showing up to work. My work is a podcast. So let me tell you how I'm feeling on this work day (laughs) and why we should be arguing for how women should not be at work the day after they have a miscarriage. So how has this kind of like changed your perspective about, you know, kids and pregnancy? Like, has it changed it at all? Yeah, it's 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 less about how do I definitively feel about being a mom or not? It's that it's the acceptance of that. We're perpetually navigating the terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're going to be really different for everybody. And I think that now, well, one, I realized how little I knew about my own body. Like when they told me I had to get a fallopian tube out, I was like panicked because I was like, well, how does that affect fertility? And the next five minutes, I can't Google this from a hospital bed. But then when I talked to women after the episode, they're like, you know, they're like windshield wipers, right? Or like those wavy guys at a car dealership. If you don't have one tube, the other one can swing around and pick up from either 
ovary? I was like, what? How did I not? Wow. And that's true. Like, how would, how did I not know that? I, this is embarrassing. Like, I didn't know that when people said they were six weeks pregnant, it means they really only have known for two because their missed period would be the fourth week and it counts from the day of your last right. period. Right. Mm. Like, there's all these, I was like, I just didn't, I think I was so anxious about it. I knew nothing and I wish I was more empowered with information so I could have mm. been a better health advocate for myself. So I would tell women if you're going to have kids and you're like me and thought it would be like willy nilly magical. (laughs) Being informed about your own body and your options and what can happen before you get into a medical circumstance is so important because people weren't hand holding. It was just like kind of like no bedside manner triage. Like, what do you want to do about this thing you know nothing about? Right. And I just think it's really important for women to be their own advocates for their own pain, for Mm. things not going right. Like I was told to wait a few weeks for an appointment when I first called in with symptoms. A few weeks it would have burst and I would (laughs) have... Right. But, you know, so, wow. you know, you know what I mean? So I think that there's that the whole medical piece of it that I was like, man, I, I, I really in being so anxious did not educate myself at all about how this process worked uh, that I would encourage people to do. And I think it just has to be okay to not ha- know d- what's certainly going to happen. It has to be okay to go through hard things. It has to be okay to be allowed to change your mind and to mm-hmm. articulate your truth at that time. And I'm not embarrassed that I wasn't sure if I wanted them. I'm not embarrassed that I was sad then when I couldn't. I'm not embarrassed that I'll I'll still probably move forward slightly reluctantly and maybe resentfully. Like I I just think the exhaustion is having is forcing yourself to have to feel a certain way about something all the time and instead yeah. of just mm-hmm. weathering it experientially as you are. Uh, that pressure. I totally get it. I mean, like in my 20s, people would ask, do you want kids in a very optimistic way? <laughs> and now at 40, people ask in a way of like, do you want kids? Because you better fucking have kids now, <laughs> right? Like you should have started yesterday. Right. And it comes with an expectation of an answer. Mm-hmm. And I used to feel guilty about answering with, I don't know. And now I completely and confidently embrace that because that is the truth. I completely just do not know in this point in time in my life. So thank you for empowering yeah. us with that story and the information you just gave us, your episodes garnered quite a response from women from all phases of pregnancy. What were some of the things that you learned from these women who are DMing you? I think that um, honestly, the biggest one is what I mentioned earlier and that people just reminding you that you like your life how it is because you built it. And Mm -hmm. comparably, you can build your life as a mother. You you have a lot of choice in the way this is handled. And the pressure put on women in the first place is a result of these stereotypes and tropes and expectations that with this awareness of knowing yourself, you can separate yourself from. There's something empowering about being like, I don't fit into this and this doesn't look desirable for me. Then, okay, so don't do it. (laughs) Mm. And I was kind of feeling the disconnect of feeling like, oh, I need to get there. But that kind of empowered me hearing from women that were more like me that were like, you don't need to get anywhere. (laughs) <laughs> You've come far as you know, far enough as it is. But also I heard from a lot of women that like said, it's okay if you don't love being pregnant, if you don't even right. connect with like an infant. Mm. Some women said it took them time till the baby was more yes. of a person and had mm. a little bit more of a personality or grew up and became a little bit more self-sufficient. Like I think that it's just not that simple that you are going to like love and embrace and be perfect in every moment. I, I heard women be like, I'm the best effing mom of a five-year-old. I was like not the best with toddlers. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And you know, and, and when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, like we're we're growing up and aging and evolving as our kids do. And mm-hmm. just to yeah, abandon expectation from how you should feel during the process, I think was helpful for me because I, you don't need the added, added anxiety of doing it and then being like, is this, like, am I good at this? Is this bad that I'm not having fun? Is this bad that I'm mad mm-hmm. at my the changes in my body? Or like, I don't know. It's just like, like women need to be allowed to exist without the quest to constantly self-improve. And I just am trying to approach the pending you know, difficulty of motherhood if if it happens as uh, not a way to like be the best and to measure myself against some outside metric, but to just approach it the way I already am. (laughs) Uh, And that's what a lot of women shared with me. I think that's Mm. so powerful because I feel like we've talked about this at the start of this episode, this like feeling of when you're ready. And some people say, you know, you're never ready and you just do it. Right. And I I almost wonder because I feel like like our parents' generations and generations of women before didn't overthink it as much. And I think some of it Mm -hmm. is a blessing that we have the choice that, you know, that a lot of us are in a privileged state now as, you know, women that like can financially support support ourselves that we don't need to necessarily like get married and have children anymore. And that isn't always the path that you have to take. But I do almost wonder like if it 
just makes us overthink the whole thing. Like we've been going around today is that sometimes just there aren't answers to some things. I love both of your thoughts on like, if you think this is like a like a good thing that we have this like thought and choice, or do you think it's almost like allowing us just overthink and not make any decisions? Because mm. overthinking, I think, I can know. be positive and negative. Well, I think the negative part is what we were talking about with when you when you try to approach it formulaically or like gamify it only to realize you ultimately don't have the choice it makes all the planning and anxiety completely useless right so i, I think that's like the the hardest part i think for me is just you know, you want, if you're feeling anxious, you want to feel in control. And then you try to develop a controlled perspective on like how you can do this manageably only to realize you have no control. <laughs> and I think I might have been better off relinquishing that from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, right. that's, that's interesting. I'm just thinking back to what you're saying, Julie, with you know, maybe our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation. And I think from, I can only speak from my personal experience, but my parents, you know, grew up in communist China where you are expected to have a kid and only one kid. So their entire life after they got married was to prepare them for a child. Right. So even at my mom's work, they're given one month a year to get pregnant. Okay. So every year, um, if your if your last name starts with this letter or whatever, wow. this is your month, and you either get pregnant that month or you have to wait till the next year wow. to do it. So the first month my mom was eligible to have a kid, she got pregnant with me, and then boom, she was, you know, a year after they got married. Boom, boom, boom. So to me, I feel like my parents grew up in a in an environment where you prep your life for kids. Mm -hmm. I feel like I personally grew up in an environment where I prepped my life for myself mm -hmm. and I've chosen a life for myself. So now this word sacrifice comes to mind a lot more because I certainly did not childproof my home. <laughs> I'm not you know, prepping my life for it. So to your question, Julie, I don't know if it's necessarily better or worse. I definitely feel I have more independence and I feel more privileged than my parents. But at the same time, it's that paradox of choice. Yep is do I have this choice now that I cannot make a decision on? I was almost going to say it like it's kind of like modern dating that we hear in the olden days, right? Is that people just, you know, did the thing that they thought they were going to do. Like there was one decision <laughs> and they didn't overthink it. But the benefits of modern dating is you can create the relationship you want. You have so many options, so many ways to form it. But then that can be completely overwhelming for some people because there's not like a clear linear path. I mean, mm -hmm. I think like all said and done, like having the options is always a benefit. But I do right. think for the overthinkers, and I think I definitely fall into this category, which is why I, you know, flip flop so much. Like I was with a partner at one point that did not want kids. It was a hard no for him. And I didn't mm -hmm. like that either. Like I wanted right. like the option, but I'm also feeling like I'm not ready right now, but I'm like, am I ever going to feel that? Yeah. Right, right. I, I think it we're better off embracing we can contain multitudes <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, change our minds. And I think that when, yeah, it's an interesting point about older generations. And I actually think, are you guys millennials? Yeah. Yep. I'm on the cusp. <laughs> on the cusp. I, I, well, the whole reason I say that is because, not to overly typecast millennials, but like, I think we, we grew up in a different world than exists now. And I think I grew up preparing for a world that's kind of like first comes love, then comes marriage, yeah. then comes baby. Traditional. Mm -hmm. marriage, like, yeah. Yeah. Like traditional stuff was what I thought my life would look like. Yeah. And then as we grew up, I like I had more options. I could focus on myself, my career, take a non-traditional path. Like, and I'm forever trying to close the gap between like where I thought my life would be yes. and where it actually yes. is. Yeah. And that's why I said earlier when you said, I like, do I want kids? And I answered, I've always have. And I now I'm just like, wow, I've never really thought about like, I, I really don't know if like, mm -hmm. I always just thought I have them or I really do want them. But I will say I wanted them more when I couldn't have them. That mm -hmm. was a big turning point. But mm -hmm. I also think that yes, like choices are always a really good thing. But I think that our generation specifically like was spoken to in a way where we're conditioned to assume that's what you're supposed to do. And I just think it makes it a little bit more complicated when you're resisting that. Mm -hmm. And I just am curious if people being raised today with more options, like are young women still being spoken to like, well, when you get married and have kids right. someday, yeah. you 
you know? Yeah. We've always been this weird cusp generation that we can remember like life before internet mm-hmm. and computers and, you know, Gen yeah. Z just never had that. That was just their life. What you said about like, we kind of straddle the traditional and the non-traditional. So it is like this, it's this everlasting conflict. And I think that's where a lot of the indecision comes from because like on one side, mm-hmm. I think, yeah, it'd be great to have a family and to have that love in my life and like all the things that come with, you know, raising children. But then on the other side, it's like the current life and all the things that I could miss out on or, you know, the kind of the loss of freedom and some of the stuff that like right. I actually do benefit today. So it's it's very conflicting all the time. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And I mean, the same, I mean, you obviously you guys are experts in talking about dating. It's like even just the conversation of like, well, when you get married or when you find a partner and like the kind of the way people talk about your future when you're a young woman is just like assuming these things things are given to you, assuming right. these things right. will happen yep. by default. It is so hard to find a great partner. Mm-hmm. It, it, because If somebody's single, it's not for lack of trying. Oftentimes, right. it's either their choice or, I mean, how incredible is it that you can choose the right partner for you and not marry the wrong person? Like mm-hmm. whenever, you know, there's no shame in holding out for the right one. And I feel like there's just so many layers to like the things that we're, we expect to be fixed about our lives that actually are products of really complicated decisions and circumstances that makes it really hard to ever feel like you are are making progress or are successful. And I think there's just a weirdness about how we can like uh, mark our progress through like the yardstick being school or grades. And then mm-hmm. you get a job and you get promoted and there are all these ways you can feel about yourself and how you're doing. And then at a certain age, it kind of becomes people, all people ask you about are your milestones. No one yeah. asked me about my career ever. They're like, <laughs> it was like, when are you getting, when you're, when, when are you getting engaged? And I got married and it was like, when are you having kids? Yep. And it's just a funny thing of like, I don't know if that's how we're trying to relate to each other, but I do think it intensifies not to change the subject, but like when you go to other people's milestones, how people incessantly ask you about yours as if they're yes. an entire function of your choice. Always. Right. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's such a good point that like this is not your choice ultimately. And but I guess the what is what could be your choice is there's always adoption. There's always other paths. Like mm-hmm. we've talked to people before of like there's a difference between having a family and having children. Mm-hmm. What is I guess your thoughts? Like if there is a world that, you know, things just don't fall into place, like what do you think this could could look like for you? I honestly don't know. I I do. I do not know. That's what's a little tricky is I, I almost can't to our point about overthinking. I almost can't overthink it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find a little bit more peace in the process because uh, I could not have done more analysis to the tune of six <laughs> hours of podcasting. And ultimately, <laughs> it turned out in no way I ever thought it would. Right. Mm-hmm. But I felt a lot more empowered to be honest about it. And I feel like I was able to heal a bit better than somebody who would have felt a great deal of shame or like I did something wrong. And I I think going forward, like I almost can't just based on who I am and my own anxieties, I almost have to kind of roll with the punches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not helpful advice for anybody. Um, but I kind of think that I spent a lot of my life looking five, 10 years ahead and trying to mm-hmm. live life formulaically. And you oftentimes just can't. And there's freedom in just acknowledging that in the first place. So we'll keep trying. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know what will happen. I guess people are kind of along for the ride on my podcast. But um, <laughs> I have no doubt I'd be a great mom. I just don't know what it will look like and how I'll ultimately get there. I think that's great advice. I I think that is the ultimate piece of advice here is to not know and and to just take it step by step. I mean, I've certainly said if I can't have my own children, I want to adopt. It's much easier said than done right. because when I finally do start those adoption papers, am I really going to go through with it? What are the feelings that are going to come up for me? So it's okay to say in the future, I can see this happening, but I don't mm-hmm. know how it's going to be once I get there. I think that's like a good segue to takeaways, but I think my biggest takeaway from this conversation is it's okay not to have it all figured out. I think so many mm-hmm. times we beat ourselves up that we don't know either way that if it's a yes or a no. But I think what I'm gathering is that things change in life all the time. I even remember I'm thinking about like when I was did not have any desire for a relationship to when I wanted a committed partner. It just changed. And mm-hmm, I think mm-hmm. this is the same. Like it's okay if things, you know, you go through different stages or it's also okay that you kind of just decide that like you're just going to roll with it and you aren't 100% ready because you've acknowledged that you're never going to be 100% ready. And I think Mm -hmm. also the other like maybe this is a little counter takeaway 
way, but I think it's also okay to overthink this because it is a big decision. I mean, I yeah. think having children is the one decision that's not reversible. And I think it's okay to think about the different pros and cons and really weigh and, you know, come to a decision for yourself. And again, that decision could change, but like feeling like you have that you're empowered to make that call. Like we shouldn't just fall into things either. Like having that ability is not necessarily a bad thing either. Mm -hmm. Totally. And those conversations become very hard to have with people because I actually think that it's good to represent the people that don't know or are a little like on the fence because there are people with really strong opinions on this topic either way, Mm -hmm. child free by choice or that have always wanted kids or have kids. And when you're kind of like wishy-washy, I've noticed that people almost take it as as common, like they take my reluctance as commentary on their choice. Hmm. You know, like and almost defend or angle the conversation against what their life looks like Hmm. and are kind of always pressuring you to find resolve. And like, I just don't think it's that simple. So, yeah, it's a huge, huge decision. And I envy people that have more clarity. But it's also being unsure, having a level of reluctance. I have no feelings toward anyone else's choices. (laughs) Yeah, I think everyone just needs to do what's best for them. But I've noticed my uncertainty makes other people uncomfortable. (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a bad parent or mother. It just means that you are uncertain at this period of time. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I I try to I try to be flexible. Like I always think about how how grateful I am that like 19 year old me couldn't make permanent choices for 34 year old Mm -hmm. me. Um, (laughs) And I don't know, I I am just trying to not let 34 year old me (laughs) project or make choices for a later version of me that has a better opinion on the matter. <laughs> I, I feel like this conversation, my some of my main takeaways are there's a major disconnect with education. Mm-hmm. We spend most of our teenage years trying not to get pregnant and talking about abstinence. And then all of a sudden, we're expected to make a choice about whether we want to have kids or not, without knowing what it's like to be pregnant and also how to get pregnant. I think as like you said before, Kate, it's before you just think, oh, you just get pregnant. You know, like if you if you don't use contraception, you just get pregnant. It's not that easy. You have to ovulate and you have to be, you know, <laughs> right. certain days of the month. My friend gave me ovulation sticks because she's like, you know, just in case you're ready. I'm like, yeah, and I'm ready to know what days I can't have sex. Right. You know? like, right. Right. <laughs> now I know. Well, like all those years they told me yeah. to get pregnant in a hot tub. That was bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that's never gonna happen. such bullshit. <laughs> so there's an education gap there. And also we're just not having the conversation as openly as I would love to have this conversation. Even I put this on myself too with my girlfriends who have gotten pregnant and are mothers. The conversations with, was either how's your pregnancy and how's motherhood? But there's kind of an in-between conversation I'm missing. And yeah. I don't ask about that. It's like, what's the transformation you're feeling Mm -hmm. or what are some of your fears and anxieties i don't we don't talk about that it's always like oh my god you're glowing you're pregnant or oh my god you're a mother and i i just had this crazy idea for all of these like diaper companies who have commercials always from the pov of the mother seeing the kid transform a newborn (laughs) transform what if there was a commercial pov of the kid looking at the mother as she transforms because we never see that side of the story so i think we're just missing so much and this can be helped with just open communication. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for for this conversation because it's also a great way to know that these are things to talk about with your partner. If you do have a partner in your life and you're making these decisions, a lot of times women feel so lonely Mm -hmm. in their decision that I have to make this decision for myself. But I think getting the partner involved in it all will really be helpful too. I think that's so dead on of like, why can't we be more vocal about the fears? Like we are in other parts of life. Like we talk about the fears of, you know, in career and even in dating in relationships, but there's something that feels so shameful and judgmental with children. I think like mm-hmm. a lot of women that know they don't want children feel like a sense of judgment and all of that coming down. So I feel like hopefully this could become an area that's just more out in the open conversation where it's okay to say that stuff out loud. Because I think hearing from you, Kate, like on your episodes and you know even the one where you like showed up the next day after what yeah. you went through, like that puts it out in the open for people that are going through something similar opposed to just like hiding it as something that no one experiences. 
Yeah, I think so many of the issues we've talked about today have to do with the burden placed on women and a lot of the invisible labor that goes on that they perform in the household and the pressure of what looking toward that even feels like even when you're not in this situation. And I just feel like the smallest way you can combat those fears and to offset in a small way the inequities women face is to make yourself less invisible in the way mm -hmm. you feel and being your own health advocate and asking other mm -hmm. people how they're feeling without projecting onto them how they should feel. I think that being vocal and open is a small place to start and making sure women's issues are talked about at any point in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the very last takeaway I have is to find role models of people that are living, you know, out of the box lifestyles that, you know, don't necessarily correlate to the stereotypes that you see. I know for me, that's been really helpful to, you know, like really see my friends' lifestyles and especially the ones that are more extreme. I don't know if I would travel across Europe with kids, but I love that my friend can do that. And it shows me <laughs> that, you know, anything is possible and you are the one ultimately in your control. Like for me, I have a fear that like my life is just going to be a hundred percent kid talk and I'm never going to be able to like have other conversations like I do now because I have seen a lot of, you know, people just fall into that trap of that's the only thing they converse about. But that doesn't, that's my decision. I can like control if that happens or not. Yeah, exactly. You can't control like the big picture, but you can control the day to day of what it looks like. And I think that in and of itself itself is empowering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm with you. A lot of people don't like when people I, I love like a breezy mom on a, you know, Parisian trip with three little ones. <laughs> and a lot of my mom friends are like, that's so unrealistic. Like it's such a problem. But I'm like, I like seeing breezy mom content. Right. It's helpful to me. <laughs> I, I want to exist in the delusion that I'll be eating macarons on the, <laughs> outside the Apple, Apple Tower with my young children. Doesn't Even sound so bad, house. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, before we wrap this up, I'm just curious from you two, what do you think about baby moons and push gifts? What are your opinions on those? I don't even know what a push gift is. You get a gift a from your husband after you push the baby up. Oh, I think, I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I'm going to say well, that. I'm being honest. <laughs> We're like both. <laughs> We're both like, Ugh. <laughs> Well, if I'm being honest about baby moons, the ideas always bum me out because you can't drink and stuff. And it like <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to <laughs> like, I want to go to Mexico before I'm pregnant and have margaritas and fun. So I don't love the idea of a vacation where I'm, I don't feel great and or can't like partake in what I want to. But if that's fun for other people. That's great. I just this, again, the sentiment of like, well, it's all downhill from here. Let's yeah. take a vacation. <laughs> right. It's a bit daunting to me. I think that's the, what I dislike about it. But it kind of reminds me of like a bachelorette party, your last hurrah with your friends. And mm -hmm. I think Ugh. like what it's known <laughs> for. But I, at the same time, I know I want a bachelorette party because I think it would be fun and to celebrate. And it doesn't mean I'm never going to have a girl's trip after I get married. So I guess in the big baby moon, I kind of look at it in the same realm that, you know, I don't like what it stands for. But I think like, if you want to do it, and I probably would use it as an excuse to like, take a trip with my partner and just celebrate life, then I think it's good in that case. That was that is a brilliant comparison. Because I mm -hmm. felt the same way about so many things with weddings and bachelorette parties, and yeah. everyone else did it. And I had some hot takes. <laughs> and then when it came my time, I just made it mine. And I had a great yeah. time. And I did all the things, but I chose what it meant to me. The overarching theoretical concept of what something means doesn't have anything to do with how you do it in practice. Mm -hmm. So true. And you can see yeah, partake in those milestones without having them be cheesy or have weird intentions. And yeah, I mean, I'll probably you'll probably hear from me next and I'll be on a baby moon. I'm, <laughs> I'm all over the place. <laughs> I'll just comment on the push gift. I've never even heard of this before, but I do not like that at all. Like I feel like it feels very sexist to me. Like you gave me something. So I'm giving yes. you a gift. Good job. I yeah. don't like that. I would not want a push gift ever. I agree. It's like, in theory, it, sa it sounds nice. But that's what <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean by be benevolent sexism. It's like these things that sound nice, that build women up on the surface, but kind of mean something a little like condescending or not condescending. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, like you got a head. Yeah. It is, It's like you got a promotion. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> I think yeah. of it as like you gave me something from your body, so I'm giving you something in return. And I just don't like that. You know what would be good yeah. as a push gift? Like the guy cuts off something from his body to give back to you. <laughs> like that's when we get, that's when we I talk, mean, right? just bring me like a plate of sushi and that's a good push gift. <laughs> or like a, a lifetime of support and equally yeah, divided exactly. life. Yo, there you go. Uh, that's just the ultimate like an push even gift. Exchange. Yeah. I just three pr 3D printed a human and I get a right. Cartier love bracelet like yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Perfect way to wrap up this episode. <laughs> Kate, where can people uh, find your podcast? Be there in five. I'm guessing on all the platforms. Yep, all the all the usual suspects. Um, and on Instagram at be there in five. It's F I V E, not the number five. And yeah, it comes out every week. It's a long form single hosted podcast on purpose. The goal, the goal to keep people company, and we talk about pop culture and millennial things, and apparently now motherhood, which is new as, as of the last year. But we can contain multitudes. Right. <laughs> I love right. your podcast. So definitely recommend it to all so of our good. listeners. Thank you guys. You're so nice to have me on. And I apologize if I'm speaking in a roundabout inconclusive way, but as you this is a very recent and raw, and I'm still kind mm-hmm. of figuring it out. So yeah, you're hearing from me in real time, but sometimes <laughs> it's better than hearing from the rosy retrospect of someone that has it figured out. So hopefully your listeners can relate in some way. No, I think that's the invaluable perspective, right? That is, I think that is the takeaway. That is the big takeaway is that we do not have to have it all figured out. Rather have raw than rosy any day. That's my takeaway. <laughs> so be there in five of it all. Just a little behind. I'll get there though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, for anybody who uh, is enjoying our podcast and enjoying this conversation, we also enjoy it when you leave us five stars in Apple Podcasts and give us a nice little review. Uh, just show us some love because we're showing you some love as well. And we're going to wrap up this episode now. Stay, Stay dateable. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag Stay Dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable.